what Liz will be Since presenting. It doesn't seem she's back on yet. I'll go ahead and do that. So um, hello, everybody. Welcome. Just a couple of quick things. Um, it's October. And so what that means is what we'll be doing in December is having our San Francisco Amateur Astronomers elections for the board for next year. So I wanted to use this opportunity, or I should say Jessica wanted to use this opportunity to remind everybody who's a member that that is coming up. Um, the voting is for members. So if you're on, but not yet a member, please consider joining. Um, and also what we'd really like to do is if anybody's interested in running for a board office, there are the officers, president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer, as well as um, directors. We typically elect seven directors in addition to the officers. So um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I think Jessica had sent an email out to everybody. So please feel free to respond to that. Or if you didn't see the email, um, you can just send an email to president at SFAA and you can find that information on the website. And then the other thing is we have a star party this weekend and due to limitations from COVID, which we're still working through with the state parks, uh, we do of course have to have a sign-up sheet now to get up onto the mountain because we have um, uh, some constraints on how many people we can have at any kind of uh, an event. And so uh, the, um, the star party, the sign-up sheet is already full. Um, and there are 27 people on the wait list. Mm -hmm. So we know that this is very important to our members. Um, we're trying to work, um, we're working very hard with the state parks to try to um, expand the number of people that we can have um, for future parties. So um, please continue to be patient. We're working through it. It's not an SFAA constraint. Um, it's a California state parks uh, and they're working through um, health departments and so forth. So um, we're just trying to get there, but uh, it'll take a little more time. So um, if you're on the wait list, that doesn't mean that you're out. Um, if somebody calls at, or emails and lets us know that they can't make it, you could easily move up on that wait list. So, um, you know, please don't, uh, please, please, uh, keep your fingers crossed. Anyway, those are the things that Jessica wanted to mention. So I think I've got that covered unless you wanted to add anything else that you're aware of, Jay. Well, I wanted to um, make known that um, uh, as of October 1st, I, I've, I've moved away. And so I will um, uh, only be hosting lectures until the end of the year. So um, there's, uh, the, the board has much interest in um, uh, new volunteers for our lecture series. So please, if you're interested in uh, helping this program to uh, contact us through the website, uh, through the president's email, through the Facebook page, or through the Slack. Um, and that being said, I will turn it over to Linda. Hello, everybody. I want to remind you that we'll always meet on the third Wednesday of every month, except we won't be meeting in December because of how close it is to the holidays. And so we'll begin again in January. Um, the speaker that we will have in November, November 16th, is Dr. Roger Blanford with KIPAC at Stanford University, and his topic is the active social lives of big black holes. It's now clear that most normal galaxies have a big black hole in their nucleus. However, these black holes can interact strongly and subtly with their environment. They can attract gas and cause it to shine more brightly than their galactic hosts. They can also acquire a massive black hole partner, which will become locked in an ecstatic dance before merging. We will learn much more about these interactions. And so be sure to tune in on Wednesday, November the 16th. I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Dan Wilkins. He's a research scientist at the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford University. His research focuses on supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. How matter plunging into them uh, powers the, some of the most extreme objects we see in the universe and the important role they play in the formation of the universe as we know it today. Alongside his own research, he's working, working towards the development of some next generations of space telescopes that will observe in X-rays from the most energetic processes in the universe. Dan received his doctorate in astronomy from the University of Cambridge in 2009. After a short research fellowship in Halifax, Nova Scotia, he was awarded NASA's prestigious Einstein Fellowship, which brought him to Stanford in 2016. He has a passion for communicating science to the public and helping people explore the wonders of the night sky. He regularly gives talks to a wide variety of audiences from universities to astronomical societies, schools, and even onboard cruise ships. 
regularly giving talks and hosting stargaze, stargazing evenings and planetarium shows on transatlantic sailings of the Queen Mary II. Tonight, Dan will take us on a voyage to see uh, where we are born within a bubble of stars. And we welcome your presentation tonight, Dan. Hey, thank you, Linda. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight and uh, share some of these um, amazing recent uh, discoveries with you all. So this evening, I'm going to tell you about how astronomy can help us answer some of the biggest questions like where the universe came from and how some recent findings are telling us more about where our own astronomical neighborhood came from. But I think the best place to start this story is at the beginning, and I mean right at the beginning. So gazing into the night sky and across our cosmic neighborhood, we're able to see how our planet Earth fits into the universe. How we are one of eight planets, or maybe nine planets, depending on your preferences in our solar system, in orbit around our nearest star, the Sun. And our sun is just one of a hundred billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. By measuring the positions of all of the stars around us, we can piece together the shape of our galaxy. And we find that it's a spiral similar to M51 or the Whirlpool galaxy that's pictured here. And the sun is actually located on one of the outer turns of the Milky Way's spiral. But even our galaxy is just a small part of the universe. Our galaxy is one of what's likely to be hundreds of billions of galaxies. And many galaxies are found grouped together in giant clusters. This is the Virgo cluster, our nearest grouping. And there are more than 1,000 galaxies in this image that are all held together by the force of gravity. And beyond those nearby galaxies, we can stare deep into the space between any star or any galaxy that we know about. And that's exactly what the Hubble Space Telescope did, combining more than 50 days worth of continuous observing that were taken over 10 years of a very small patch of sky, smaller than the head of a pin that we hold at arm's length. And that image that it produced is the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. By staring at this small patch of the sky for that 50 day period, we're able to see the extremely faint light from some of the galaxies in the farthest reaches of our universe. And what is absolutely amazing about this picture is that when we look at a patch of sky that we previously thought to be empty, and we keep staring, we see that there are galaxies and galaxies and galaxies just as far as we can see. Now light travels fast, but it doesn't travel instantaneously. These galaxies are so far away from us that the light from them took 13 billion years to get to us. Now that light was already one third of its way here before the planet Earth even formed. Now that means that we're seeing these galaxies not as they are today, but as they were 13 billion years ago. So by staring into the farthest reaches of space, we almost have a time machine. We can see some of the first galaxies that formed in the universe, and by comparing them to the nearby galaxies, we can turn the clock back and we can understand how these galaxies formed and how they developed over time. And those galaxies form part of a larger structure that we call the cosmic web. If we measure the positions of all of the galaxies in the sky, we see that they're arranged along these long filamentary structures like a spider's web. We can see galaxies that are clustered along the filaments, and then where those filaments intersect, that's where those giant clusters of thousands of galaxies form. 
Now, this isn't actually a real observation. This is a computer simulation of a virtual universe called the Millennium Simulations. And those simulations predicted how this cosmic web structure naturally forms from the matter early on in the universe. But we can do measurements and we can measure the positions of galaxies and we find that they follow almost precisely this same sort of structure. So with all of these findings, let's try to work out a recipe for making a universe. How did the cosmic web form? And how did the planets and the stars and the galaxies grow within it? Well, first of all, we need to ask the question, what is it all made of? Now, zooming all the way in, the material all around us is made up of atoms. Atoms have a structure kind of like this cartoon. They have a nucleus in the center. This is comprised of two different types of elementary particle called protons and neutrons. And then we have electrons that travel in orbit around the outside of that nucleus. Different numbers of electrons produce different chemical elements. The number of electrons on an atom determines the properties of that material. And the simplest atom that we have is the most abundant atom in our universe, and that's hydrogen, where there's just one proton in the center and just one electron traveling around it. And these atoms made of protons and neutrons and electrons are the fundamental building blocks of the everyday matter that we're familiar with and that we're made of. We also need a force to hold our universe together. And that is the force of gravity. Gravity is actually a mutual attraction between every bit of stuff in our universe. Every bit of matter and every bit of energy in our universe is attracted to every other bit of matter and every other bit of energy in our universe. Gravity is a mutual attraction between everything. Now, that might sound slightly strange. We don't feel that we're being pulled towards everything around us. That's because gravity is so very weak that we don't notice it every day. The only time we notice gravity is when there's something really massive around us. And the only thing near us that's that massive is the planet Earth. So the force of gravity attracting us towards the Earth is what keeps us, keeps us on the ground. And the stronger, to get stronger gravity, what we need is to have more material clumped together. So the more material you have clumped together, the stronger the gravity is going to be that pulls things towards it. And that's going to be really important as we carry on this story of our universe. If we have a small pocket of our universe that just has a little bit more material than its surroundings, a small pocket of our universe that's a little bit denser than what's around it, it's going to have stronger gravity than its surroundings. So that means what starts out as a small clump is going to pull more material towards it. So small clumps are going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, this force of gravity is also what keeps our solar system traveling in orbit around the sun. The mass of the sun means it has enough gravity to hold all of the planets in orbit around it. And in the same way, gravity is keeping all of the stars in orbit in our galaxy. Even though we might not perceive it, our solar system is actually traveling in orbit around the center of the galaxy. The universe around us is always in motion and it's always changing. Now this universe we live in is getting bigger and bigger. Starting in about 1917, Vesto Sleefer discovered that when we look at the most distant galaxies, they're actually traveling away from us about 600 miles per second. And over the 1920s and 1930s, 
with Edwin Hubble, this picture of an expanding universe became clearer and clearer and clearer. They found that the closer galaxies are moving away more slowly and the galaxies that are further away from us are moving away more quickly. And this was really big news. The force of gravity should be attracting everything in our universe together. But this just isn't the case. Our universe is flying apart. Something is defying the laws of gravity and causing our universe to expand, causing the galaxies to all be moving away from each other. And if we can think about this expanding universe, as time goes forward, everything is moving away from everything else. We can also think about turning the clock backwards. If we run the clock backwards, so we predict what would have happened in the history of the universe, that means everything earlier on in the universe would have been closer together. So as we go further and further into the past, we expect everything in the universe to have been closer together. Light takes time to get to us from the farthest reaches of the universe. The further away we look, the further back in time we're seeing. And those furthest galaxies that we saw in the Hubble Extreme Deep Field are galaxies as they were 13 billion years ago. But 13 billion years ago, we are seeing the universe when it was smaller and much more densely packed than it was today. Now, that might sound incredible enough that the universe has expanded over time and earlier on, it was much more compact. But what becomes even more remarkable is experiments that were done with the Hubble Space Telescope through the 1990s and 2000s, undertaking some of the most precise measurements of how the universe is expanding by measuring bright supernova explosions that we can see in some of the most distant galaxies. They uncovered something amazing. The universe is not just expanding, but it's also accelerating. Now, if the universe was just simply expanding at a constant speed, that means everything could have just started at a single beginning. Everything got pushed once, and then it just kept flying away from each other. But then gravity will start to pull everything back together, and it will slow down that expansion. For the expansion of our universe to be accelerating and speeding up over time, we need another force, a force that is pushing our universe apart. If we also trace our universe back to the very beginning when everything was crushed down into an incredibly dense, early, small state, that takes us back to the Big Bang. The Big Bang is that moment in time when everything in the universe would have been compressed together, when we just follow this expansion back. We also find that to explain the universe we see around us, that not only is the universe accelerating in its expansion today, but right at the beginning, it also needed to expand very quickly as well. Now this mysterious force that's pushing everything apart and driving the expansion of the universe is something we call dark energy. And dark energy actually makes up more than 70% of the constituents of our universe. The material that's made up of the normal atoms, those atoms that we're familiar with, those atoms that make up you and me, that make up the planet Earth, that make up the sun and the stars, make up only about 5% of the total contents of our universe.
there's far more material in our universe than we can see and that interacts with light in the normal way. We call this extra mysterious material dark matter, and we know it must be present from the amount of gravity that we measure holding galaxies and clusters together. There's more than five times as much mysterious dark matter than the normal matter. But even that only makes up 30% of the universe. The dark energy that's driving the expansion of the universe makes out 70% of the universe. And I'll let you in on a secret. When we as astronomers use the term dark in dark matter and dark energy, it means we know it must be there, but we don't have a clue what it is. So where did it all come from? Well, as I said, we can trace this expansion back in time. In the beginning, the whole universe was very small. Everything in our universe, all of the matter and all of the energy was compressed into a very small volume of space. Now, our whole universe weighs about 10,000 billion, 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 billion tons if you add everything together. And if you've got this much material, compressed into a very small amount of space, we know it can't be made of normal atoms. The early universe was not made of atoms as we know them, but it's governed by the mysterious laws of quantum mechanics. The early universe was very hot with all of that energy compressed into a small volume of space. And it's described by the laws of quantum fields, which are oscillating up and down, kind of like waves on the surface of the ocean. And our laws of physics can let us understand this down to 10 million billion 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 billionths of a second after the Big Bang. But then if we go before that very small fraction of a second, everything is so compressed, even our laws of physics, as we understand them fail to understand it. But we can put a, a time on this by measuring how fast the universe is expanding now and tracing it back. We can work out that this early hot state of the universe that expanded from the Big Bang happened about 13.82 billion years ago. And then it went through this very early period of expansion that we call inflation. And as the universe inflated and expanding rapidly, the energy in it got spread out, so the universe cooled down. Now, early on in the universe, everything was compressed together, that it was dense enough and hot enough that about 10 seconds after the Big Bang, nuclear fusion reactions could start. At these extreme temperatures and pressures, protons and neutrons are forced together to start to form atoms. And then the small atoms, hydrogen and helium, are forced together to create larger atoms. These nuclear fusion reactions lasted only around three minutes. But in these three minutes, the carbon, the nitrogen, and the oxygen in our universe were created. But at this time, the universe was so hot and so dense that light wasn't able to pass freely through it. And because unit light couldn't travel through the universe at that time, that means we're not able to peer back this far in time. The light from this period in the history of the universe isn't able to escape to reach our telescopes. In order to get a view, of the early universe, we need to wait until the moment in time where the universe has expanded and cooled down enough that the light is able to pass freely between the atoms. And this first light that could pass through the universe gives us a snapshot of the universe at this moment in time. Now, back then, everything was so hot that this light started out as high energy gamma rays. But as the universe expands, this high energy radiation gets stretched out into X-rays, then to ultraviolet light, then to visible light, and finally to microwaves. 
And that's how we observe this moment in the universe's history today. We can find these microwaves that are left over from the very beginning of the universe, permeating throughout the entire universe today. And we can measure them with instruments such as the Planck satellite. This is called the cosmic microwave background. And this is what the whole sky looks like in this microwave light that was left over from the Big Bang. These are some of the most detailed measurements we've made of what the universe was like right at the start. As I said, it's a snapshot of that moment in history when light started to be able to travel freely through the universe. And what we see is the sky is covered in patches. There are some hot patches and there are some cold patches. The hot patches, we're looking at little clumps in the early universe, little bits of the early universe where there was more material and the temperature was slightly higher. And then the cooler patches are the parts that were a little more spread out, a little bit less dense. Now, the early universe was like the wavy ocean with everything moving around and fluctuating. And we're seeing those waves imprinted across the sky. But these little clumps that we were left with as the universe expanded, that just happened to be slightly more dense than their neighbors, became the seeds of the galaxies that we know around us today. Because if we have a little bit of the universe that's just slightly more dense than its neighbors, it doesn't need to be much, just a little bit more dense, the force of gravity attracting things towards that clump is slightly stronger than the force attracting things to the neighboring clump. So that means what starts as a little clump attracts a little more material, then its gravity gets stronger, so more material comes in, then the gravity gets stronger and this cycle continues. So these clumps grow bigger and bigger and bigger and are what become the galaxies. And we can play a computer simulation of how this works. We can see what starts off as a small clump starts attracting material along filaments of the cosmic web. And then as this material gets pulled in, it starts to grow the galaxies. And if we let this video play, we can start seeing the spiral shapes of some of the early galaxies forming in this computer simulation. We have a giant galaxy growing at the center of this cluster, and we have some of its neighbors growing around it. So we can start to build up this timeline of our universe, starting at the Big Bang, letting the clock run through that three minutes of nuclear fusion, that moment in time when light started to be able to travel that we can see as a snapshot in the cosmic microwave background. And then we have this hot universe with these little clumps in it, these little clumps that are attracting more material the gravity is pulling this material together, and as the universe expands, that gas is cooling down. So we're starting to sow the seeds for the stars and the galaxies that we see around us. But then it all went dark. This gas is just cooling down. It's got nothing to heat it back up again. So the glow of the early universe is fading away. And before we can start observing things again, we need to wait until our early universe had lights in it. We needed to wait for the first stars. Well, thankfully, that same force of gravity that's pulling the gas onto those seeds that's growing the galaxies is also what produces the stars. The clouds of gas that are growing into the galaxies are also clumpy. 
And it's the same story again. The slightly bigger clumps will start attracting more gas towards them. And those bigger clumps get bigger and bigger. Those clumps also get compressed. The gas in those clumps is getting pulled together. And as it's compressed, those little clumps start getting hotter again and they start getting denser again. And eventually they get so hot and they get so dense that we can once again start up those nuclear fusion reactions. And nuclear fusion is the process that powers starlight. Once we get those nuclear fusion reactions started in these clumps of gas, they're able to keep themselves heated, keep themselves glowing, and they become the first stars. And it took about 150 million to a billion years after the Big Bang for us to get through these dark ages and for the first stars to switch on. And after we've got these first stars lighting up, the galaxies start to grow. And then after this time, we start getting those first visible galaxies. This was about 13 billion years ago. And these were those early galaxies that we could see in that Hubble Extreme Deep Field image. And then over time, these early galaxies are what grow into the types of galaxies that we have around us today. These galaxies start growing bigger. They start developing their characteristic spiral structures. Galaxies that are nearby start merging with one another growing even larger galaxies. Within these galaxies, we've got new stars growing. And around those stars, we start to form the planets. But where exactly are those new stars forming? New stars have been forming almost continuously in different parts of our galaxy throughout its history. So if we know where to look, we can actually see stars still forming within our galaxy today. Now, in order to form new stars, we need to have reservoirs of cold gas. If we have gas that's too hot, that gas will start to push outwards against the force of gravity that's trying to pull it together. Just like if we have, say, a can that we heat up on a stove. Now, please don't try this at home, but if you take a sealed can and heat it up on a stove, you can blow the top off of it because the gas inside the can expands and it pushes outwards. And exactly the same thing happens in these gas reservoirs in our galaxy. If the gas is too hot, it's pushing out against the force of gravity that's trying to pull it together. And we need the force of gravity to be able to pull it together in order to form new stars. And we can find these reservoirs of cool gas in what are called molecular clouds that we can see in some of the nebulae. Now, one of the most famous examples that on a dark night, we can actually see with the naked eye, and I'll play this animation again, is the Orion Nebula that we can find in Orion's sword. If you look at Orion on a clear night, on a dark sight, you can see that the sword isn't just made of stars. It's kind of fuzzy, it's kind of gaseous. And the Orion Nebula is one of these molecular clouds. And if we zoom in on it, we can see how this cloud of gas is forming stars. Now, if we just look at these clouds with visible light, all we see is the cloud because the dust in the cloud actually absorbs the visible parts of the spectrum. 
But if instead we look at these clouds in infrared light, such as this image of the Orion Nebula from the Spitzer Space Telescope, we can actually peer right through that dust and gas. Infrared light is able to travel through dust. And that means we can see how embedded in this giant cloud of gas, we've got new stars, new bright and hot stars that are growing by collecting the gas from the clouds around them. There are many beautiful examples of star formation in our universe. Another one is the Eagle Nebula in the constellation of Serpents. And if we look into the heart of the Eagle Nebula, we find one of the most iconic images that the Hubble Space Telescope ever captured. This is the image that is known as the Pillars of Creation. These are giant columns of gas. Each of these clouds, this one on the left, is six to seven light years across. And one of these tiny finger-like structures at the top of the cloud is actually bigger than our entire solar system. That is the sheer scale of this system we're looking at here. But the pillars of creation are another one of these giant clouds of gas that's being pulled together by the force of gravity. Again, looking with Spitzer at the infrared light, we can peer through that gas and we can see that as the gravity pulls that gas together, new stars are growing inside as that gas clumps up, as those clumps get crushed together, and as the nuclear fusion reactions are able to start up inside them. Now, it turned out that today was a very good day for me to give this presentation to you because it was today that NASA released the first image of the Pillars of Creation from the new James Webb Space Telescope. Now, JWST is the most sensitive telescope that we have ever had in the infrared part of the spectrum. So we really can see the details of these beautiful pillars. We can see the stars within the pillars and we can even see the structure of the gas on the surface of the pillars. It kind of has this lava-like structure. It's got these protrusions in the surface, this texture. And this is because those young stars are quite hot. They're much hotter than stars like our sun. And these young stars start blowing winds of gas off that's traveling at supersonic speeds. And the supersonic winds from these new stars push out the structure of the pillars and produce this texture that we're seeing. And earlier this year, the James Webb Space Telescope captured a similar image of star formation in progress in another system called the Carina Nebula. Just like the pillars of creation, we can see how there's that dense cloud of dust and gas at the bottom of this image. The new stars are forming within this dense cloud. And then just above the cloud, we can see the hot, bright, newly formed stars. And it's these hot young stars that actually produce the shape of the nebula we're seeing. The shape of the cloud in the Carina Nebula and the shape of the pillars of creation is carved by the radiation that's coming off of these young stars. As the light, the ultraviolet in particular light from these stars hits the surface of the cloud, the surface of the cloud evaporates. And it's this evaporation that's carving the clouds into the shapes that we're seeing. The other thing that happens as these young stars start carving away at the surface of the cloud, 
the emission from these stars actually puts a pressure onto the surface of the cloud. The starlight itself is exerting a pressure onto the outside of the cloud, and it starts trying to very subtly squeeze the cloud together. And this squeezing of the cloud from the outside is triggering the next wave of star formation. So we can imagine that this cloud used to extend to the top of the image, the new stars formed and evaporated the gas around them. But now these stars are pushing on the edge of the cloud and the next wave of stars is forming along the surface. And this process will carry on as more and more stars grow and eventually deplete this cloud. So I've told this story of the history of our universe from the Big Bang through the growth of the first galaxies and the formation of stars. But I've missed a rather important part of this story. The universe that I've just described is actually pretty boring because we had our three minutes of nuclear fusion right at the start that only produced hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And then we have the nuclear fusion in the stars we've created. But most of those stars throughout the course of their lives in what's called the main sequence, all they're doing is through their nuclear fusion, converting hydrogen into helium. So I've described a universe that really doesn't have much chemistry going on. We have hydrogen and helium and a little bit of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. What we need is somewhere in our universe where we can get the density, the temperature, and the pressure even higher so that we can start even more nuclear fusion reactions that are able to turn those light chemical elements into the heavier ones. We need the stars. The stars are an integral part of the formation of our universe. Now stars are nature's nuclear reactors and throughout their life, in one way or another, they're responsible for almost all of the chemical elements we have around them. Through most of their life, what's called the main sequence, like our sun, they're just converting hydrogen into helium. And they can do that because the temperature in their core is about 15 million degrees. But in the center of the, the sun, we can't push together the helium to make any heavier elements. Bigger atoms take more and more energy to squeeze together. And the core of a star like the sun is not hot or dense enough to make any of the large elements. We need to wait until stars come to the ends of their lives. We need to wait until they run out of the hydrogen fuel in their core that they're using to power the starlight on their main sequence. Now, when a star like our sun, which has a radius of about 430,000 miles, runs out of fuel, it will become what's known as a red giant star. Its outer envelope will expand to nearly 90 million miles. And as that outer layer expands, the force of gravity in the core is able to crush the center of the star together. This means the center of the star gets compressed even more than it was before. The density gets even higher, the temperature gets even higher. And eventually this crushed core of the star becomes so hot and so dense that it's finally able to squeeze the helium atoms together to make bigger atoms. 
then the red giant star will start running through its helium fuel, and then it'll run out of helium. And then the same thing happens again. It runs out of fuel. The force of gravity then pulls its core together and it gets even hotter and even denser. And then when it gets hot enough and dense enough, it's then able to start squeezing together things that are even heavier than helium. So we can start squeezing together carbon. And this goes on and on and on with this combination of the gravity pulling the star together, increasing the pressure and increasing the heat coming out of the core, we can eventually produce the conditions that are needed for nuclear fusion to join together all the different chemical elements in the star. So our red giant star ends up almost like an onion with fusion happening in the lightest elements on the outside, the hydrogen gets converted to helium on the outer surface. But then as we go deeper into the star, the heavier elements start getting joined together. So helium gets joined into carbon and oxygen. Deeper still, we can join carbon into neon and magnesium. Then eventually we can turn neon into oxygen and magnesium. Oxygen, we can then turn to silicon. And then when we get all the way into the center, where the temperature and the density are the most extreme, we can start squeezing together silicon and we can start making elements such as nickel and iron. So through a red giant star, we now have the ability to produce many, but not all of the chemical elements. We can go all the way up to iron. However, the laws of physics tell us that there is no nuclear fusion process. No matter how hot or how dense you crush the center of this star, there's no way you can get things hot enough and dense enough to crush iron together. There's nothing we can do to join iron via nuclear fusion and make any of the even heavier elements, things like gold and platinum and uranium. If we want to make these heaviest elements, we need to wait for the red giants to run out of all of the fuel it needs. And only in the final death throes of a star is it able to start making the heaviest elements. Now, even stars like our sun will never be able to go through a process to make the heaviest elements. They're just not massive enough. They just don't have enough material. To make the heaviest elements, we need the most massive stars. Stars that are more than about 10 times the mass of our sun. Now, when they come to the end of their red giant phase, when they run out of the fuel they need for their red giant phases, once they've turned everything in their core into iron, gravity starts pulling them together so spectacularly fast that the energy released as the gravity pulls this star together is enough to turn that collapse around and make the whole star explode in a spectacular supernova explosion. Supernova explosions that are so bright that we can see them in even the most distant galaxies in our universe. And these supernova explosions scatter all of those chemical elements that the star has made in its nuclear reactor throughout the galaxy. What's left after the supernova explosion keeps collapsing. Gravity keeps pulling on it, keeps compressing it smaller and smaller and smaller until we end up with something like the mass of the sun. So 2,000 billion, billion, billion kilograms. That's about 5,000 billion, billion, billion pounds. We end up with that much material compressed into a space that's about the size of San Francisco. That is material that's about 10 times denser than the nucleus of an atom. That causes those electrons on the outside of the atom to get squeezed into the protons in the nucleus. 
the electrons and the protons get squeezed together and become neutrons. And if the star isn't too heavy, they can actually then push back against gravity. If we don't have too much material left in this star after the supernova explosion, these neutrons can then resist gravity and they leave behind a neutron star. Many of these neutron stars are found in binary pairs. And if these pairs of neutron stars orbiting around each other, they'll eventually spiral in towards each other and collide. We have two balls about as heavy as the sun each, compressed into the size of the city of San Francisco, flying into each other at about half the speed of light. That is a gigantic train wreck. And it's with that much energy that we can finally make the heaviest elements that we know of, like the gold and the platinum and the uranium. And what we know is that the material that we are made of on planet Earth, the material that the sun is made of, must have already been through these processes. The material we're made of must have already been through stars. It must have been through stars coming to the ends of their lives, through the red giant phase, producing the lighter elements, then a supernova explosion scattering those elements into their as surroundings, with a few of these cosmic train wrecks of neutron stars colliding with each other, scattered around us to produce the small amounts of things like gold and platinum. So how do we fit in to all of this? How can we understand our own stellar neighborhood within this picture of stellar life cycles? Well, one of the best tools for exploring our stellar neighborhood is the Gaia satellite. This was launched in 2013 by the European Space Agency, and it's flying out at the L2 Lagrange point, which is where the James Webb Space Telescope is also located. Now, Gaia is a satellite that's got two telescopes on it. The satellite spins around, and those two stellotopes are continuously scanning the sky. And Gaia has an array of specialized instruments to precisely measure both the positions and the motions of all of the celestial objects that it sees with these telescopes. In particular, Gaia has produced a precise 3D map of all of the stars in our Milky Way galaxy. This isn't a photograph of the sky. This is the Gaia map of every star it can see in our galaxy. So you could imagine this sky is wrapped around the planet Earth, but here that sky has been unwrapped onto the flat screen. And with its precise velocity measurements, we can actually use Gaia to predict how the positions of these stars will change thousands of years into the future as each of these stars travels on its orbit around the center of the galaxy. So we can actually play that video. And um, so if you look down here, you can actually see Orion. Here's Orion's shoulders, belt and sword with the Orion Nebula in the center. And it's quite interesting to watch this video and see how all of the positions of the stars are changing as they travel around the center of the galaxy. And now we're almost 200,000 years into the future with our predictions. And we can see that our sky isn't static at all, but these constellations that we know and love, like Orion, are actually starting to fly apart. You can see that already the shoulders have started to disappear and the belt is starting to fall apart. So how can we use Gaia to understand star formation that's happening around us? Well, earlier this year, a team of astronomers that was led by Catherine Zucker, 
at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics were using these Gaia measurements to precisely map the regions of star formation that we know of close to us. These include some of the most well-known nebulae. These are clouds of molecular gas that are being pulled together by the force of gravity to form new stars. And in fact, many of these you can observe yourself with telescopes. We've got the Taurus molecular cloud. We've got the Ophiuchus cloud, something called Corona Australis in the Southern Hemisphere, and the, and the Chameleon Nebula. And using Gaia, they were able to accurately pinpoint the locations, not just on the two-dimensional sky, but in three dimensions. And they were able to trace out what's known as the local bubble. The local bubble is a void that surrounds us. It's about a thousand light years across. And inside this, this void, this bubble, the gas is somewhat lower density than it is in the rest of the galaxy. And by low density, I mean, if we take a square centimeter, sorry, a cubic centimeter of space, each cubic centimeter of space has on average 0.05 atoms in it. So that means we need about 20 cubic centimeters of space before we even find one atom in this cloud. That's about 10 times less than the gas in the rest of the galaxy. And what Zucker and her team discovered is that those nearby star forming regions are actually located on the surface of this bubble. So this is the picture that they put together. Each of these lines traces the filaments of gas within those clouds. So these squiggly lines represent those clouds, those star forming regions. They also looked at the young stars that are nearby. So the stars that formed more recently. And those stars are shown by these arrows. And they found that it looks like those recently formed stars are just inside the surface of the bubble. And they're moving outwards as the bubble is expanding. And here's a similar image. This is the two dimensional projection. And this is a similar image in three dimensions, again, showing the nearby clouds, showing the local bubble, and then showing a similar nearby bubble that looks to be expanding as well. By looking at how quickly this bubble is expanding outwards, they were able to run the clock backwards to figure out, just like we figured out earlier when the universe started expanding at the Big Bang, running the clock backwards on this bubble's expansion, they were able to figure out that it started expanding out from the center about 14 million years ago. So what caused this local bubble, this lower density gas expanding around us? And why are the regions of star formation near us located on the outer surface of this bubble? Well, the answer lies with supernova explosions. About 14 million years ago, about 15 supernovae went off in what started out as the center of this bubble. And as each of these supernova explosions went off, it started this process of sweeping up the gas around it. So this hot supernova explosion is injecting energy into the gas around it. The supernova pushes out the gas, expanding this bubble. That means the gas that's pushed out by the supernova is slightly hotter than the surroundings and it's slightly lower density than the surroundings. The low density of this gas that's been pushed out by the supernova and the fact that it's a little bit too warm means that we can't easily start any star formation inside the bubble. But just like we saw in the Carina Nebula and in the Pillars of Creation, the expansion of this gas pushing out against the gas around it 
that pushing of the gas on the edge of the shell means that we can trigger star formation, not in the bubble, but on the edge of the expanding bubble. So as this bubble expanded, it triggered star formation on its edges. And then because the bubble was expanding and the gas was moving, the stars that were formed continue moving outwards with the bubble. So that explains why those young stars that were formed relatively recently appear to be moving away from us. So those young stars aren't the stars that are forming right now. They're the ones that formed a little while ago and they formed on the edge of the bubble where it was at the time. And then those star forming clouds that we see now, those stellar nurseries are forming on the edge of where the bubble is today. So with this picture of supernova explosions from an early generation of stars sweeping out and pushing away the gas, inflating the local bubble, we can understand why the star formation happens to be on the edge of the shell and why the younger stars appear to be moving outwards with the bubble. So this leaves us with the local bubble of that lower density gas that's too hot to form stars. And those nearest stellar nurseries are all on the outer shell. Now the sun happens to be in kind of in the middle of this local bubble. But how does the sun fit into all of this? Well, the sun is much older than the bubble. The calculations of Zucker and her team suggest this bubble started expanding about 14 million years ago. And our sun is about 5 billion years old. So the sun wasn't really involved in this action. The best theory, based on measurements of how everything in the galaxy is moving, is that actually the sun and our solar system wandered into this bubble about five million years ago as we were traveling on our orbit around the center of the galaxy. So even though we probably didn't play a role in the bubble, it means we get to witness all of this happening from the inside. But that being said, we know from the amazing array of chemical elements we have in our solar system, the fact that we're able to build things out of iron, the fact that we're able to make jewelry out of gold and platinum, the material that we're made of must have been through at least one cycle of stellar birth and death. And it's very likely that the material we're made of came from a similar bubble it's quite possible that our sun formed on the edge of a similar bubble of gas, expanding from some supernova explosions that went off much earlier in the history of our universe. Now, by staring into the farthest reaches of space, space we can see that our, our universe, not as it is today, but how it was in its infancy, just by the amount of time it takes the light from the furthest parts of the universe to reach us, lets us witness the history of the universe as if it's happening now. We can learn how the galaxies were assembled and how the stars and the planets came to be within those galaxies. And by observing the star formation that's happening around us, and by tracing the local bubble back to its origin, we can see how new stars are born within our galaxy. We can understand how the entire life cycle of stars from their birth to their demise is essential for our existence. And we can come to understand how in a way we're all made of stardust. Or thinking of stars as nature's nuclear reactors, maybe we're just made of nuclear waste. Well, I'll uh, stop there and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much for um, that, 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 that conclusion. I hadn't thought of that perspective. I'm not sure what yet to think of that. <laughs> um, we'll gladly take any questions uh, uh, from our attendees. You can um, just speak up if you wish, or you can type into the chat and I will read your questions. And we have one already coming in from Prasad. Um, Hi, Dan, thanks for the nice presentation. All the galaxies 
have these supermassive black holes with hugely massive gravitational force. So I'm wondering why all are forming disk shape and not clustering all around the black hole. Well, the, the secret to avoiding the, the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy, and yes, you're right, um, every major galaxy that we know of in our universe, we think has a supermassive black hole sitting at its center. The secret to avoiding the pull of that black hole is traveling in orbit. We're far enough away from the black hole and we're moving in orbit around the black hole fast enough that as the force of gravity tries to pull us in towards the center of the galaxy, we're flying on by on the outer edge. And it's exactly the same as why the planet Earth doesn't fall into the sun. Just by moving fast enough in your orbit, you're able to, to keep away from the force of gravity. And, uh, and that's what lets our galaxy stay in its spiral shape instead of all clustering together near the black hole in the center. I was uh, curious when you were uh, speaking of the uh, formation of galaxies, uh, if, if we have, I know, I know we're most familiar with uh, galaxies being in a disk shape, um, but is that the most common shape? Uh, you know, they, they could form in, in orbs or uh, other sorts of clouds. Um, yeah, so we actually see galaxies in, in quite a few different shapes. And we think the, the shapes they have depends on both the stage they are in their, their own lives and when in the history of the universe they, they formed. So, so we think the galaxies like our own that are in sort of fairly calm environments end up settling into the flat disk spaces. And that's due to the, um, the rotation of the gas as it falls in, the, the way the gas is orbiting around its common center as it collapses in the early universe naturally produces these flat disk shapes and then ripples that end up running through that disk can produce the the spirals um, so we see a lot of spiral galaxies um, the milky way our own uh, the andromeda galaxy the whirlpool galaxy there's there's a huge number of spiral galaxies um, but we also see a lot of galaxies of different shapes um, the other common shape are what we call elliptical galaxies these are just sort of big blobs they they don't really have a a shape to them. They're just sort of big round, sort of oval egg-shaped galaxies. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that a lot of those are formed when um, later on in their life cycles, those spiral galaxies end up being pulled together by gravity. So multiple spiral galaxies get pulled together and they, they collide with each other and they merge with each other. And that, that act of those galaxies combining with each other destroys the neat disk shapes and leaves this, this sort of amorphous blob. And then the third type, we actually think, if you look at the, those Hubble deep field images, we actually see that the, the early galaxies are a little bit different as well. They're not these nice ordered flat disks with nice spiral shapes, but everything in the, the early universe is a little bit more irregular. They're kind of disk-like, but a little more clumpy and bubbly. And it, it looks like they haven't quite settled into, into their shapes. Hmm. Hmm. Like a sort of a messy cookie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that, that reminds me also of when you were speaking of when stars are forming in, in, uh, these, uh, stellar nurseries. Um, I, I wonder how common it is if, if we, um, if these stars are forming, uh, close to each other, does the gravity pull them together? Do, do we, do we see often collisions in these stellar nurseries? And so a lot of the time, the, a lot of the stars don't collide early on, um, because they, as they, they form, they have enough motion that um, they escape each other's pull. So just like I said, we could escape the, the black hole in the center of the galaxy. Um, these stars um, are able not to collide with each other, but it means that actually um, a lot of stars we find in binary systems or triple systems. So there are um, uh, a fun one to look at um, actually with a telescope is something called Alberio, which is a double star. That's two stars that are traveling in orbit around each other. Um, so their, their gravity keeps them together and keeps them traveling around each other, but they um, don't collide just yet. Um, but in billions and billions of years time, once they finish their lives and they, they leave behind neutron stars or white dwarfs, then actually they can start falling into each other. And uh, that's what uh, produces some of the, the gravitational wave signals that we've been detecting recently when eventually 
late stars late in their lives can eventually collide with each other. Hmm, fascinating. I'll have to look that one up and I don't know how to spell it. Abiria. I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, very good. You said that, um, of course, our sun is 5 billion years old. And, but did I understand you to say that the bubble into which we are now entered, how, what was its age? Four, I wrote down 14 billion, but that's probably wrong. About 14 million. A million, so million, uh, million. Much I'm more thought, recent, actually. Than yeah, I, that's what than I was looking at my notes and thought, nah, I have to ask about that. Amazing. And, and at one point, I, I'd heard that the, the, the bubble is around 1,000 light years wide. Uh, yes. Is that, is that correct? 1,000 light years wide? Yeah, this will be interesting to people who are showing um, at a star party, mm. stars that are, you know, 500 some light years away from any direction we look. I mean, it'll be, this will be an incredible topic to share with many, many people. Yeah, and what's nice about many of these, these nearby star forming regions is you can um, see them even with quite a modest telescope. Right, right. Yes, and you mentioned um, the, the uh, Orion Nebula. I, I, I love how easy that is to show someone. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's A L B I R E O, Alberio, Alberio. Um, uh, you were mentioning in in the um, Cygnus constellation, I believe. Yeah, that's the one. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, we got a question in from uh, Prasad. Uh, to be more specific, why galaxies are forming in a different kind of flat plane with different shapes? So it's, it's kind of to do with how the gas comes into the galaxy. So um, if you imagine that the cosmic web I showed earlier on, that gas is kind of on the, the streams traveling towards um, each other as gravity pulls it together. It's mm -hmm. only if you get a perfect head-on collision does everything sort of meet in the center. If those streams slightly miss each other, and chances are they will, they end up flying past each other. And that's what creates a kind of rotation. So as these streams come towards each other and start pulling towards one another, they'll rotate like this. Yes, yes. And that the, the, defines the the kind of the flat plane that the, the disk ends up up forming in. The, the the inertia of their velocity, they would they would keep going, but then a gravity would start pulling it in, and eventually they might find this balance. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, you have to conserve the momentum it's got. The laws of physics say you're not allowed just to get rid of momentum when it doesn't suit you. Um, and that's what, what keeps them rotating and uh, keeps them in the, the disk structure. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and feel free to keep asking uh, further clarifications if you wish. Uh, we have another question incoming from Liz. Uh, not sure if I heard you mention it, but how long does it take for a star to form? And so it really depends on the, the environment they're forming in and the, the size of the, the star. Um, but the, the process of these clouds collapsing into gas can, can happen in, in much less than a, than a billion years, um, sort of, which sounds a long time, but it's quite quick on, on cosmic timescales. So you, you can sort of get this, this process going in sort of tens to hundreds of millions of years. Um, and then a star like our sun, um, will survive on its main sequence, which is the, the phase the sun is in at the moment, where it's sort of just uh, calmly going through its life, converting hydrogen to helium. That phase for a star like the sun will last kind of 10 billion years or so. Um, but actually bigger stars, um, everything is much more intense with a bigger star. Everything, the, the gravity is stronger, the temperatures get higher, and all of the nuclear fusion reactions run much more quickly in the bigger stars. So the, the bigger stars actually end up going through their lives much more quickly than the, the more modest stars like our sun. Hmm. Hmm. I have another question. Oh yes, go ahead. Um, are stars ever visible when they are younger in the millions of years? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's what I thought. Uh -huh. um, so then yeah, we... baby, baby stars. Yeah, there's a, a lot of interest in studying the, the baby stars, the, the young stars. Um, they, um, we can see, um, yeah, we see that the younger stars, they're much hotter, they're much more active, they're much more violent. Um, when we look at even the youngest stars, um, 
we can even see that they still have a, a disk of gas around them. And it's that disk of gas that ends up forming into the, the solar system of planets. Um, but yeah, we can we can absolutely um, observe um, smaller stars, younger stars. Um, yeah. Did I show you that behind me is the Rosette Nebula? Ah, oh, yes. And 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 it's re it's something's you know making it not show. But in the middle, of course, is this completely black center with all yes. of these stars pouring out, which I understand to be baby stars, and that they in fact do have gas and dust. Um, whoops, where we go? But <laughs> gas and dust surrounding them. Yeah. And uh, and I, but I don't remember how close that is to us, the the rosette. But um, so th that's what I was wondering. I always assumed they were babies and hot, active babies blowing away the material that surrounded them and everybody going their separate directions. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's Not sticking right. around. <laughs> we're out of here. Yeah. 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 And that's why you have that uh, that that rosette shape as well, because right. those stars have evaporated the, the gas from the center of the cloud. Yeah. The Rosette Nebula is a distance of 5,200 light years or 1,600 parsecs mm. away. Mm -hmm. um, and its size uh, is a radius of 65 light years. Ah. We have a question coming in from Pascal. Uh, it begins with a comment. This talk is amazing. Oh, thank you, you are a uh, yeah. clear presenter. Thank you so much. On the chart showing the evolution of the universe, can you please review which laws of physics dominate or explain the unfolding process at different times of the expansion of the universe? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I guess the, the way to think about this is there are kind of, depending on how you consider them, there are kind of four fundamental forces in our, in our universe. Um, we have the, the force of gravity, that's this mutual attraction that pulls everything together. Um, there's the electromagnetic force that is responsible for electricity and magnetism, but also for light, um, and also the interaction between atoms. So the same electromagnetic force that um, powers electricity and um, is responsible for the light that we can see is also what causes chemical reactions. Um, it's also why... Um, my body and the chair are pushing away from each other. It's the reason I'm not falling full through the floor. That's the electromagnetic force between the atoms that's holding us apart. Um, and then there are two other forces that are associated with um, nuclear physics and, um, the, and the centers of atoms. Mm -hmm. um, it's something called the strong force, which is what binds together the nucleus of an atom. Um, and then there's something also called the weak force that um, is kind of weird. It's how subatomic particles change into one another, and it's responsible for some of the radioactivity we see. Um, so just running through the universe from the beginning, um, at the beginning of the universe, um, we actually don't know very well um, the physics um, that un that, that controls the, the beginning of the universe. Um, at the, the very hot early stage of the Big Bang, um, the laws of physics we have so far aren't quite developed enough to explain all of that. But then as things cool down, the, the forces that we're familiar with start to emerge. Um, so we think that very early on, there was actually only one force and it was all of the other forces were actually kind of combined into a single unified force, it's called. And then as things cool down, that force separates into different types of behavior. And those are the fundamental forces we, we have today. And this is the cutting edge of theoretical particle physics that seeks to understand this. But then when we have that hot, dense soup of the, the early universe with nuclear fusion happening in it, that's the strong force that's dominating, the nuclear strong force that's binding all of the atoms together. Um, that is responsible early on in the universe. And then as things cool down, um, we start, we have nuclei and then we have electrons whizzing around. Um, those electrons, when they get cool enough, get captured by those nuclei. The um, Early on, we just have the nuclei formed and we have the electrons. Um, and then it's the, the force of electromagnetism that means when the electrons are cool enough, the nuclei can grab them and that's what forms the atoms. Um, and then 
electromagnetism remains the dominant force when um, we've got this hot soup and we've got all of the light unable to escape and bouncing around. Um, and then all the time happening within this, we've got the clumps that are pulling together and that's gravity. So all the time, all this other show is happening, we've got gravity sat in there as well that's, that's pulling things together. Then finally, as the universe keeps expanding, it, everything gets much less dense, everything cools down. The, the nuclear forces are contained only now within the centers of atoms. So when we're in the space between atoms, we're not experiencing that anymore. Um, when we get far enough away from other materials, the electromagnetic force um, becomes weak. So then as we get into larger and larger scales of the universe, then gravity really becomes the, the dominant force that's responsible for making the galaxies, making the stars and, and holding the cosmos together as we know it. So it's a grand tour of the, of the, of the fundamental forces. Thank you. I, I remember um, the, they were working on uh, unifying them and, and um, I haven't, I haven't quite heard an update on that being finished yet. I, I, um, but I'm, 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 I hold out. I'm, I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I want to comment. I, I really appreciated the, uh, the animation of the, uh, constellations. I remember reading, um, HG Wells, uh, time machine. And, and as he traveled through time, uh, sitting in the seat of his time machine, as, 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 uh, the passage of time was accelerating and accelerating, he began to see the constellations move and just fall apart, as you said. Uh, are there any further questions from the audience? Uh, Liz writes in with a wonderful presentation and thank you very much. Thank you. Um, anyone else please speak up? Um, or um, uh, Pascal writes in, wow, thanks for that explanation. So um, Pascal was asking the, uh, the earlier question that you, that you just answered. Um, I would say again, thank you for everybody uh, attending. Um, and uh, uh, thank you, doctor, for presenting with us. Um, thank you, Linda, for, um, for scheduling. And, and um, uh, we hope to see everybody again next month uh, at our final lecture of the year. Linda, do you have any? Oh, I just to want say? to thank, thank Dan for this wonderful, brilliant, organized, illustrated presentation and, and the way that you explained the bubble. And the fact that we hap just happened to be in it. When I first heard about such a thing, I was so thrilled to be able to have you present it tonight. And it's fantastic. Thank you. It's been an absolute now, the, pleasure. The only thing wrong with it is that thousands should have seen it. <laughs> thousands. Well, we've, instead of just we've, us. <laughs> we've recorded this presentation. And, I know and, we did. And um, it'll be available on our website for, for more views. And we do get more views afterward. I'm so um, pleased. I did, I, yeah, I remember too now the, uh, the idea of the stellar wind pushing against um, the nebula uh, particles to create those cloud shapes. Uh, that was a very clear uh, explanation of that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. No, thank you, it, it's been a pleasure. Great. Well, I am uh, going to stop the stream now and we will no longer be live on the internet and um, Thanks everybody for coming, toggling off. We are now no longer live. Uh, again, if anybody wants